much, Josephine, for the invitation to share our results. My name is Lenaisha Jungsberg. Uh, I'm a social scientist and worked as a researcher. I'm today with my colleague Yartis, who is a human geographer, uh, also a researcher, and we're both working in the broad field of regional development in the Nordic countries. Yeah, we work for an institute called Nord Regio, and uh, it's a research center for regional development and planning. Uh, it was established by the Nordic Council. Josephine, you just muted them. Sorry. Oh. Oh. Can you hear us now? Oh, yes. Sorry. We can hear you now. Yes, thank you. Mm. Okay. Uh, I was talking about uh, this institute uh, and that we are mostly conducting solution oriented and applied research. Uh, within the field of regional development and spatial planning. And we try to uh, address current issues from both the uh, research perspective, but also from the perspective of policymakers and practitioners. Uh, the study we've been part of has the aim to explore the role that immigrants have in labor market in remote and rural regions with demographic challenges. And also this include long-term social integration. Uh, the research was uh, in two parts. It's, it was a quantitative analysis of numbers and composition of migration into, Nordic, into the Nordic countries and the regions. And then we had case studies in selected, uh, selected regions to explore better the process of integration. And we were six persons that did this uh, research uh, where there were always one native speaker going to the uh, regions. Um, some of the key concepts, uh, which is all part of our study, is the foreign-born, which is the person residing in a country but born in another country. Immigrant, a person who moves to another country with the intention of staying for some minimum period of time and who receives legal permission to reside in the country of destination. Asylum seeker, a person who has fled from his or her own country due to the fear of persecution and has applied for protection in another country, but has not yet had the claim for protection assessed. And once these persons receive refugee status, they receive residence permits entitling them to stay in the country. Finally, refugees, a person who has been forced to leave their country in order to escape war, persecution or natural disaster. And refugees are protected in international law. Yeah, and it, it can uh, easily, even, these categories can easily be mixed together and, and for example, who can work and he, who cannot work. And, and in uh, most cases, asylum seekers are not allowed to work because they have not received uh, a work permit at that time. But uh, in what, uh, which category a migrant is, uh, is uh, can determine the type of service and support uh, he gets. And, uh, and it's usually refugees that get a longer introduction program in the destination countries. Uh, in the Nordic countries, it's often between one and three years uh, of integration program, but it's handled a little differently in both Iceland and the Faroe Islands, uh, <clears throat> where there is uh, not as a formal system for this, but the, and it's more like uh, in, in, in the normal service for the resident. Uh, and and this uh, introduction programs often involve language learning, uh, learning about uh, culture, politics, and history, and general to help the immigrants to uh, integrate into the new society. Mm. Uh -huh. Yes, and now we go to a bit of an overview of the Nordic countries. What we see here is an animation showing the old age dependency development from 2000 to 2015. And what you can see is that the darker brown, the higher the old age population 
uh, is the share of the total population. So basically you see when it's the darkest brown is over 40% of the population. And in 2015, the colors get dramatically more darker brown. Um, this has um, impact on society and creates challenges in many levels uh, for the future. Excuse me, what is old age? Uh, old age is uh, the group of people uh, over 65 and above. And uh, many of those who are no longer on the labor market. Yeah. Uh, then uh, if we look a little bit better into it, but we also have the children uh, under the age of 15 uh, in these numbers, uh, then we can show the development of the total so-called dependent population. Uh, uh, those who are not yet in working age and those who are uh, past their working age. And the dark blue color uh, shows higher demographic dependency. Uh, and from 2007 and to 2016, only nine years, uh, there has been a substantial change. And we can see the dark blue is where the dependency is uh, over 70% of the population. Uh, and here we can see the impact of excuse, me, excuse me can you yep. go back one and then please tell me what the the dark blue is where you have kids and older people is that it yeah, so yeah. Exactly. yeah. a high proportion right. yes. yeah. okay. it's, of those age groups it says demography dependency but it doesn't say which one you include in these percentage whether it's but no, I was trying to uh, okay. explain so it, but it's... The, this is the people outside the workforce, is that correct? Yes, yes. correct. It's, Thank it's you. Between zero, um, children between zero and 14, and uh, uh, elderly above 65. And also it appears that Sweden and Finland have higher challenges than Denmark and uh, Norway in 2016. Yes. Any other questions? No. Uh, then we look into the next map where we can see the impact of international migration on the Nordic countries from 2011 to 2060. And we are looking at the population numbers. Uh, and uh, the green color uh, represent areas uh, where there is a population uh, growth regardless of international uh, migration. The yellow uh, color represents uh, areas that have had a population growth due to international migration. And the red color, there is a population decline and international migration is uh, not <laughs> able to change that uh, development. Mm. Yes, so from 2011 and 2016, a total of 310 Nordic municipalities, which is 26% had population growth because of immigration. And if you look also on the small map, the one showing only the regions, you can see that this is actually the majority. Um, and the, the reason for this statistical difference is because the regional centers, such as in Sweden, uh, Lulu and Umeå in uh, Nor uh, Westerbotten and Norbotten, they have had growth in their cities, so they kind of statistically make up for the entire region. But as you can see, the more rural and remote areas are the red one, that's actually 485, and that's 40 percent um, of all municipalities, they had a declining population, and it is all the red colored uh, areas on the map. Um, and of course, it's important to remember also that different type of immigrations, and some of them are labor migrants, some of them are, are students, some of them citizens returning back home after having been abroad. And then there's also the whole uh, uh, um, category of refugees uh, coming to the Nordic countries. Yes. And uh, uh, any questions on this map? No. No, it's very clear. Yeah. 
So there, due to international migration, there are 310 Nordic municipalities that have had a population growth due to this international migration. Yes, and the potential for the declining population is obviously existing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, here we can see the development from 1990 to 2015 in the difference between natural increase and uh, migration and see that uh, starting 2006 and 7 uh, there is uh, the increase is substantial in that migration uh, and and is uh, there is more growth coming from that than the natural increase mm. in the whole region and just to clarify the natural increase is based on fertility and mortality Whereas the net migration is the number of immigrants yeah, moving in and out yes. of the countries. One question, please. Yes. Um, <clears throat> this says uh, the net migration, and that mm -hmm. could be refugees or asylum seekers or whatever. But it could be yeah, everyone. experts from yes, experts, yes, everyone. So and people moving back to their uh, country of origin yes. as well. Yes. Okay. People so living abroad. Right, and coming back. Yes. Good question. <laughs> um, another interesting statistic is that young adults make up a large proportion of foreign born population. In Iceland, we see that 13.5% of the population was foreign born in 2015. And between the ages 26 to 37, the foreign born population made up more than 25% of this age group. And this is, of course, important seen in a labor market perspective and in a demographic composition. For Denmark, immigrants and their descendants made up 12.3% of the total population in 2016. And uh, between ages 27 to 34, uh, more than 30% of, um, of the population uh, were in this group. Um, yeah. Uh, now we're going to look a little bit into the case studies regions uh, where we went uh, last year, late last year. Uh, those regions are all struggling with declining and aging population and uh, often labor shortage. Uh, the, re the regions are considered rural uh, and rather remote. Uh, and we wanted to identify good practices and barriers uh, to successful integration and to understand the migrants' role on the local labor market. Uh, and there uh, we went to Isafjörður uh, in Iceland, in Herre in Norland municipality in Norway. Uh, it was Krokom in Jutland in the middle of Sweden. And there was the Pirkenma region uh, and the municipality of Pukalainen uh, in Finland, and then it was uh, Fredrikshamn in northern Jodland in Denmark. Um, the profile of these case municipalities is that Fredrikshamn has a population of around 60,000, and the foreign born share is 6.3. Uh, Pukalainen in Finland is 3,049 people living there, and they have a 3.6 percentage foreign born. Isa Fjordur in Iceland is a, community, is a municipality of 3,623, and their share of foreign born is 13.4%. In Heira in Norway, uh, it's a municipality of 1,743. And their percentage of foreign born is 12.5. In Krokum in Sweden, uh, there is 14,785 and uh, a foreign born share of 6.4. Finally, in the Faroe Island, Klaxvik municipality has 4,680 with a percentage of foreign born on 7.2. Um, so you can see they differ quite a bit in the size, which also provides different local challenges for the municipal planners. And this is also part of why these areas were chosen, both because some of them already have been quite engaged in uh, local integration strategies and some of them have 
been less engaged, but has still have a high percentage uh, of foreign born living there and being part of it. One question, please, if you go yeah. back again to that one. Um, so you actually put in different nations, uh, municipalities in, mm -hmm. into a group with municipalities from other countries without sort of saying what do they have in common? You say you take the variation at the same time as you take the different countries' municipalities. Is that correct? I mean, uh, for instance, the biggest one from Denmark, Frederikshavn, uh, mm -hmm. of those 60,000, they have maybe 25,000 is living in the town, Frederikshavn, which mm -hmm. probably will differ a lot from the other ones. Uh, do mm -hmm. you have anything else that these areas that you selected for the case study, what do mm -hmm. they have in common? So there's some interesting, uh, actually, things that Fredrikshavn, Isafjordur and Heroi has in common, which is fisheries and the role and dependency of uh, uh, labor migrants supplying the fishing industry with labor. Um, then there is in Krokum in Sweden, a very, um, how can you say, driven uh, regional authorities about making an integration strategy. And uh, for Pukkalainen in Finland, yeah. they have been quite internationally known actually for some of the work they've been doing. So we were very curious to know about what they are actually, what was actually going on there, since they received a couple of prizes on the European level for the integration work. Um, so yeah, so it's it's uh, it's qualitative. So, so they they have prices for integration work, but they have only three percent of foreign borns. Yes, mm -hmm. but you can say there's big difference between the type of foreign born being there. Like if you have humanitarian migrants, if you have labor migrants, those municipalities with the highest percentage of foreign born are all with labor migrants, um, because they. Um, are a rather big share of, um, of, of those communities. Where there has been an offer of uh, labor and, and people are moving mm -hmm. due to that reasons. Uh, while in both Sweden and in Finland, in the regions we choose for there, there's mainly refugees coming to the areas. Yeah. So, uh, so, they so you lot. actually now say that uh, this is either refugees or it is not. It might be labor workers coming to this place. So yeah, we're using that as, as, a, as a fact, but it's not part of the statistics. Is that correct? So foreign born, as we showed in the beginning, the key concepts, these um, um, categories are interlinked. So foreign born cover also refugees. Foreign born cover labor migrant refugees and people in the asylum. Like it's, it's a larger group, you could say. Um, and one really uh, important aim also for this qualitative part has been to dip into the diversity, like not have as much aim of being a strict comparison, but more get as many nuances and pictures uh, to be able to inspire other municipalities um, among the uh, Nordic countries. And we are also, uh, a big focus is how immigrants can make up for lost resources in, in these municipalities mm -hmm. that are all have that in common that they have uh, been dealing with a declining population. Mm. Yes. We'll move Thank on. You. Maybe some things will be more clear along the way also. Uh, immigration and successful integration uh, can be vital to rural towns and regions uh, facing population decline and labor shortages. And immigration and a long term uh, integration and social inclusion uh, can be looked at as, uh, as a regional growth issue instead of uh, the uh, focus that is often been on uh, the social challenges involved. And if we go then a little bit uh, to each and every case study. Mm -hmm. So region in Jämtland, Heyerdalen in Sweden, uh, just a few pictures to set the scene here. Um, and here I'm more of an overview, you can see where it's located. And for the whole region there's 127,000 and the uh, percentage of foreign born is 8.4, which is rather high compared to Sweden. 
is 16.8 on the national level. Yeah, so, so the uh, proportion is rather low uh, compared to the most regions in Sweden. Mm -hmm. Yes, and the slides illustrate the fact that the size of the population in Jämtland is the same as 100 years ago, while Sweden's population rose from 6 to almost 10 million. Then Jämtland grew from 124,000 in 1915 to 144 in mid-20th century and decreased again, um, coming back to 127,000 in 2015. Uh, it means a lot of challenges, such as a lack of labor, an elderly population, less supply of social services and business services, and challenges in terms of economic development. So the region and the municipality has therefore adopted a clear vision to attract international immigration and taking advantage of the globalized society. Um, Jemplan has worked to increase the number of persons who accept an offer of dwellings in Yemen. And this is something which is organized by the Labor Market Directory in Swedish Arbeitsvermittlingen in collaboration with the municipalities. Uh, in this figure you see here, it's the place where the refugees are applying for asylum. And the method they are initiating here is to uh, try to get the, um, the uh, refugees getting a residence permit to stay in the nearby area. And as you can see also there has been an increase from 2012 to 2014 where it's been going from 44% in accepting dwellings in the region to 71% accepting dwellings in the region. And one of the reasons for these good results are that they've tried to individualize uh, the offers really be in a longer and more in-depth dialogue with the people, which has been a change to a more systemic and top-down approach of placement uh, of each uh, of the families getting a residence permit. Um, so uh, one thing which they are very aware of in Yemblem is also the fact that a person is issued residence permit doesn't mean that he or she will stay there. So therefore, they have the strategy, which is a holistic approach, um, trying to make the family uh, free time, even free time interests, um, job skills, etc., fit into a bigger picture of where they could uh, become included in the local society. Uh, one case study region was in Clarksvik uh, in Faroe Islands. Uh, and the total population of the Faroe East is 49,000 uh, people. Uh, still, we find uh, people from uh, 89 countries uh, living in, in the Faroe East uh, with a total number of 1,400 uh, foreigners. Uh, the majority comes from Iceland, the Philippines, uh, Thailand and Norway. But the Icelandic migrants are about half of the uh, immigration population. Um, in 2008, an immigration office was established. Uh, and in 2015, there was hired a special integration officer. Uh, the task for the integration officer is to formalize and improve integration efforts across the Faroe Islands. Uh, and, uh, the Faroe East is a good example uh, to show uh, where uh, the whole policy of uh, immigration and integration can be initiated to where little attention has been given to this uh, matters uh, before. Uh, uh, and Klaxvik uh, was the first municipality to formulate uh, an integration policy and is a good example of how the initiative can come uh, from the local level uh, and there they have a um, uh, focus on language learning, information and communication, community involvement, the networking uh, and they have also integration committee that is uh, has uh, representatives from uh, the immigration 
community within the municipality. Uh, so those who make the policies and, and uh, manage the system can hear their concerns and challenges. challenges. So they, they get them involved in the process. Uh, we have, if we go to Finland from the Faroe East, <laughs> uh, in the Pukalainen uh, municipality, uh, the population uh, has been decreasing and aging, uh, but they have a long history of integration projects uh, and, and know the, and, and are familiar with the presence of others. Uh, the Red Cross Asylum Center uh, has now currently around 185 people living there. But in 2015, the number went up to 367. Uh, immigration and integration uh, has been a priority in the municipality. Uh, and the local community has been willing to help newcomers and uh, both uh, you know, all public sector companies and NGOs in the area. Uh, there have uh, some amount of local agricultural businesses and small and medium-sized enterprises that require labor, labor in the area. And the town has been able to offer suitable housing and services for uh, asylum seekers and uh, immigrants. One question, please, if yeah. you go back to that one, is um, how, where is the, the economic uh, obligation? Are they placed with the municipality or is that with the region or the state, please? Mm. So, so there is transfers, of course, there's like a national budget. And then there's like local services provided by the municipality, including ensuring like the payment of like the social housing is usually deducted from the social service they would get, uh, as long as they are unemployed or as long as they are part of the integration program. Okay. Uh, the outcomes that they have had of this uh, integration program in the area, uh, uh, there are more immigrants uh, that see the future in the area than before. Uh, it was usually after staying in the asylum center, the uh, refugees, uh, after getting a, a refugee status, they left the municipality, but uh, more ha stay now since they find a job in the region. And uh, for the last couple of years, the, there has been an increase uh, in the locally housed immigrants. It, uh, a few years ago, it was 24 uh, locally housed, but there are over 120 today. Uh, and yeah, they, they, they say that the refugees have had a positive impact on the local economy and the viability uh, of the willits. Uh, they have hired a special integration coordinator uh, that has been able to fix job and, and, and uh, places in school for 80 refugees uh, that have been chosen from the reception center. And uh, this, uh, what I was talking about is this integration uh, to leader through leader projects, uh, and since 2011, Pugalainen has been investing in the integration and the welfare of immigrants, uh, and uh, it's done through the series of leader project uh, that is uh, originates from the uh, EU, and uh, the leader project uh, higher. Uh, an immigration uh, coordinator to solve all the basic uh, issues that can come up and build bridges between the newcomers and the residents uh, and the society in Pukalainen. Mm -hmm. So it's a, a, it's a hand -on, hands on uh, approach that they had there. Yeah. And after receiving this funding from EU uh, Leader Action Group program, um, the, by the end of 2016, uh, the municipality now had to like finance this position themselves, 
but rather than doing that, they prioritized to change the content of the position. Um, so they made it a more heavy administrative uh, position. So the local integration coordinator, she resigned, she refused to, to make this change because uh, the need of this social bridge building would would not then be met and uh, and and she was protesting uh, but with no uh, results unfortunately so she moved to another municipality and is today working with some other integration processes there and now it will be interesting in the next year or more to see if the how how it will be in Pukalaitun and whether there will be a decline in like the integration and the social cohesion and even for the companies who is uh, dependent on getting this connection with the newly arrived migrants. Um, so this is one example of a recent event which we absolutely didn't foresee and it's as I said earlier on it's a uh, it's a municipality who received prices in the EU for some of the work they've been doing because of the uh, high majority of those people arriving there becoming into work and becoming well integrated uh, so this is yeah interesting interesting to follow um, in Finland as a regional initiative for integration uh, by Pirkenma Center for Economic De Development Transport and Environment and they have been stressing how the integration process should be more work-based um, and that the current system for labor market integration is considered relatively heavy and non-flexible. So they are in some pilot project where they try having a combination of four hours language and four hours works to ensure better career and also help to avoid the gaps between learning language and moving to the labor market. And also what we see is if it takes a lot of time for the, for the people settling in a new country to learn language, um, the longer time it takes before they enter the labor market, the less risk, the higher the risk is that they will be long term unemployed. So there's really here a need to look into the skills and competences and combine that with language training. Okay, and then we go to Norland County. Uh, they have initiated an in migration project uh, to mitigate long term effects of out migration uh, to avoid labor shortage in health, construction and fishery and to ensure population growth um, because as you can see today there is um, uh, 261 241 sorry uh, in 2015 241,000 inhabitants approximately and um, seen in a period from 1970 it's uh, only 2,000 less but seen as a share of the population of Norway is a decrease uh, which they are now working on the regional level to um, change. So this in-migration project is a four-year project. They are implementing in cooperation with the Norwegian Labour and Welfare Service, NAB, um, also with the Confederation of Norwegian Enterprises, uh, Norwegian Association of Local and Regional Authorities, and Centre for Competence Development. So this is a very systemic project where they give out funds to several actors uh, to support competence building to support more apprenticeships, uh, support national, regional, local actors, uh, in, including being more inclusive uh, with the newly arrived migrants. Um, just interesting enough, this uh, region, it's uh, primarily people from Poland, Lithuania, Somalia, Sweden, Eritrea and Thailand which is like the top six uh, countries of origin of migrants living there now. Um, and the main reason in Norland County is uh, work, which is 36% of the people moving there, uh, giving that as reason, but also followed by family reunification, 31%. And, um, and then there's the refugee group, which is 23% and the education students coming to pursue university degrees, et cetera, is uh, approximately 8%. Uh, so Bodø is the regional center in Norland, and they are having a lot of fishing, fish processing, but also tourism. And there is a high dependence on labor migrants there. And uh, for instance, one human resource manager as, 
at a fish processing plant was saying, we haven't recruited new workers in years because if we hire one Polish worker, there'll be 10 more knocking at the door. Uh, this also entailed there's some competition between uh, the refugees when they finalize the introduction program for that group, which doesn't have uh, degrees, university degrees, etc. And looking for unskilled work, they are in high competition with labor migrants coming uh, from European countries. In Hero and municipality, uh, it's also fish processing, and there's labor migrants, family reunification migrants, and refugees. Uh, and there's little or no interaction between these groups. Um, there is a program to place these and to support them being well. But there are also challenges away because, for instance, the people coming from Syria uh, and Damascus having lived in a high urbanized life, they are not feeling entirely uh, sure that how well they are able to adapt to a much more rural uh, municipality and much more a much smaller village, basically. Um, and also, uh, what is uh, interesting here is the role of civil society, which is engaged in language uh, cafes, female mentor programs, and so on. And this has been part of helping also several labor migrants, which do come with higher degrees. So there are engineers, there are people with bachelor and master degrees from Romania, even yeah, several other countries uh, who come and work full time on a fish processing uh, plant. And when they start to learn Norwegian, they're actually able to move to other work uh, workplaces and utilizing their degree when it gets validated and so on. But the language is a key in this case. Yeah. yeah. From Norway to Iceland, uh, Isafjörður uh, is the municipality. It, it is consists of Isafjörður, which is the largest settlement in the area with around 2,500 inhabitants. Then it's four smaller villages uh, with a population between two and 300 uh, people. Uh, here you can see where the municipality is uh, located. Uh, and uh, there is this total number of immigrants in the area is 527. Uh, of a total population of 3,608. Uh, I was looking at the newest numbers uh, yesterday for 2017. Uh, and the immigration population is mainly based on labor migrants, but also on migrants that come due to family re reunification. <laughs> uh, uh, Im immigrants are very important uh, for the municipality. Uh, some uh, industries and companies would not thrive without immigrants, uh, and many uh, of the immigrants uh, work in jobs that the natives don't want. Uh, and we see uh, workplaces where Polish is the main language spoken. Um, but uh, apart from uh, being uh, Many in the fish processing industry, there is has also been a shortage of blacksmiths and welders in Iceland, and there is a, a company that make uh, machineries for uh, fish processing uh, located in Isafjörður, and they are in a big need uh, of people with this education and experience, and they have been going to Poland in the beginning to uh, get uh, welders and blacksmiths. But uh, and they could have more people working with them. But then there is another problem that is uh, the housing issue. There is a shortage of housing uh, due to uh, a tourism uh, and a second home. So a lot of houses and apartments are occupied due to those reasons. Uh, when people come as uh, labor migrants, it's maybe not the first thought that they are in need of help. They have job when they come and usually the housing has been fixed use, uh, with the help of the employer. Um, and uh, the intention is often not to stay for a long time, but uh, many of them end up staying much longer than they intended in the beginning. Uh, and even though everything happens in peacefulness and harmony, uh, we can wonder if that's enough in the long term. Uh, 
because if we think about maybe a married couple that don't uh, maybe work actively on keeping the relationship good, uh, they drift apart if they just take each other for granted that they just are there. And what we see in East of Hildur is that the, uh, the community is uh, separated, two separated communities. And, and because of the Polish uh, population is quite large, there is a rather closed uh, Polish community within the municipality. And a lot of people that we talked with, we talked with people from the schools and the uh, labor market directory and from the multicultural center, which is located in Iceland, but it's on a national level. Uh, and and we, we heard it quite often that the people were talking about that there were second class people uh, being made being made by this segregation uh, uh, a population that has less access to new jobs uh, they are in disadvantaged position in the education assist, educational system they lack skills maybe both in Icelandic and the native language and would also uh, be in a disadvantaged uh, uh, position if they would move back to Poland and then we are talking about uh, maybe kids that have and most of their life in Iceland, but a lot within a Polish language in, within this Polish community. Uh, and these signs of segregation are also quite clear in the elementary school. Uh, and if we look at uh, all Iceland, then uh, numbers show that the dropout rates of secretary schools are especially high for immigrants. Uh, in Isabirdu, there is now being uh, drafted integration policy and a lot of municipalities in Iceland are going uh, through that process right now. Uh, maybe it is ready, I didn't manage to get an answer before today, uh, but uh, it was so, it's supposed to be, about to be ready at least. Yes, um, as you can see uh, in Fredrikshavn in northern Jutland, uh, there has been a population decline. Uh, from 2006 to 2017 and this affects the local businesses and making them highly dependent on now uh, labor migrants. Uh, it's particularly the fishing industry which is vital importance especially short intensive periods um, and also um, to, uh, to diversify a bit more uh, because there uh, there are um, periods with the boom, economic boom, where everyone is employed and the migrants are employed. Then there's also periods where there is a more difficult time to get work. Yes, I know we are running over time. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, but this is our last case study and, uh, <laughs> and then we will go to very fast to conclusion and we still have hopefully 10 minutes or so to, uh, to, uh, to questions and discussion. And um, so why are they working with integration uh, of labor migrants? Because it can influence the negative demographic development and strengthen local uh, business community. And they have a key focus on work and housing, uh, practical help, active civil society. And there's been uh, different people in charge of being initiators of local integration strategies. It could be the mayor, a business employment coordinator, a local union representative, integration consultant, establishing coordinator or housing consultant. And some of them are very much engaged in, in strengthening the local community and ensuring the cohesion, uh, uh, supporting uh, the newly arrived to be part of like learning the language and organize the Danish language cafes but also formalize the dialogue with the migrants um, through Facebook groups and uh, foreign citizen networks and so on. So this really sums up that language is crucial for the long-term integration. And uh, in most countries, uh, in, Nord in Nordic countries, once two years of language training is provided for free. And the question is, is this enough to really master a Nordic language? Uh, but it shows that, uh, like in I Iceland, for example, where we, uh, where I've been talking about this segregation, that the language is a barrier for that, and and it's often that labor migrants they need somehow a stronger uh, 
incentives to learn the uh, native language so they can really uh, blend and mix in with the local uh, community. Uh, but this incentives is be, uh, often due to long working hours and that they have to usually they have to learn the language after long hours of work. Um, but as mentioned also before that having um, learning a language and getting your um, degree validated, it can mean a labor migrant coming with for instance, a bachelor degree can move to other parts of the labor market rather than the unskilled labor force. Um, so a few ways forward is combining language training with work and vocational training access to language courses while already waiting for asylum before getting any residence permit, e-learning in the remote areas and regional coordination to increase this access. And also really, really important is those areas which has more civil society engagement. Those are the areas with more social cohesion and a better integration of the newly arrived migrants. Uh, the job matching is a persistent challenge uh, for the refugees that often compete with the labor migrants over low-skilled jobs and uh, there is uh, a clear need uh, to have focus on early mapping of skills and competences to help people to get in uh, uh, yeah get them integrated uh, according to their competences uh, and validation and vocational language training could be improved in many of the places that we looked into and uh, or maybe in relation to the needs of the local and regional labor market. Uh, and uh, we have seen that it can be made attractive for employers to provide apprenticeships and, and we have example from Sweden where even the mayor in Östersund uh, has an apprentice and, and is therefore yeah, leading the way for others. Um, so we focused a lot on the labor market uh, integration and the importance of getting a job. But basically, if you want migrants to stay in, uh, immigrants to stay in rural and remote areas, there's really a need also to look at this more holistically and focus on social network and social inclusion. So um, besides having a job, besides having a house, there's also the feeling of being at home and wanting to stay. And this is crucial for regions which is declining in population and want to attract new and want to build uh, cohesive communities. Uh, civil societies are crucial. Once again, we can't highlight this enough. The support for the civil societies could be strengthened. It could be stronger. Some places it's active, some places it's not. We want to see it active everywhere. And then schools, uh, when there is family reunification, when the kids get uh, to school and they got to mingle with the classmates, this is really, uh, a place also uh, where people can get involved and where integration actually can happen because you sometimes see that uh, foreign born uh, or immigrants uh, they don't really come to um, pa they don't. parents meetings yeah. and, it's, uh, yeah, and it's often understood as they are not interested but it's uh, uh, quite often uh, due to language barriers and then we might be need to find some kind of other way to get them involved and, and uh, support families within the civil society is also an example that was named because in Isa Fjord in 96, there came a group of photo refugees that all had support families. And that was something that I think everyone we talked to and had lived in the town long enough uh, mentioned that as a good and successful uh, integration. Uh, integration is a two-way project and regions do have a vital role. Uh, coordinate actors, as we saw with the leader program, the EU does have money, so there are possibilities to raise and seek funds for new projects, new ideas. Uh, this also can include facilitate knowledge exchange and capacity building in local areas. Uh, mapping labor market needs is ongoing some places, but can be strengthened. And then there is the providing vocational language training and leading the way, as we see Norland is initiating immigration strategy. Yimland has also a clear vision and immigration strategy. And we have some key messages. It's uh, maybe the importance of integration coordinator 
uh, which can be very, like we talked about in the Finnish case, uh, case hands-on, effective in solving all kinds of uh, problems that come, can come up, like finding housing, internship, jobs, mentors, and, and also leisure activities. And there are also civil society organizations that are important, like the Red Cross, uh, that often uh, provide meeting places and activities uh, for uh, integration. And uh, But uh, overall, we think it's very clear, and the Norwegian case especially show that, that the successful integration requires clear political leaderships and collaboration between different actors. And in Norway, it's the national, regional, and local level that work together on this integration program. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the last two slides here, some basic conclusions. We have to make sure the migrants want to stay. Language is crucial. There's a mismatch we need to address between refugee skills and job requirements. Mapping of skills, even of the labor migrants, is really important. We don't want engineers to work at fish factories. It's a lax. It's not a sustainable uh, way of utilizing our human resources and society. And companies and public employers are playing a major role in this validation and apprenticeships. Uh, like we have said before, uh, the immigration and integration is vital to many of the smaller towns in the Nordic region. And, uh, and validation of skills seems uh, pro uh, problematic in some sectors and not least maybe in the health sector where it can be really difficult to get uh, your education validated. And then uh, it also has to be sure uh, that's maybe mostly in case of refugees that uh, maybe to prevent this mismatch that can be between housing and jobs because where there is housing, uh, it's not always available jobs, and that does not really uh, mix, uh, fit well together. And we need to pay uh, attention to all immigrants, uh, not only refugees, when it comes to giving some kind of uh, help with integration and, and help, and, and then also maybe open the eye of the uh, local. Uh, communities. Yes, and seeing this as a regional growth issue and as a regional development issue rather than as a social problem. So thank you so much for listening <laughs> and finally we would like to open the floor for more discussion and uh, and listening and just finally, finally just to say that we are also contributing, I don't know if you can see this, to Integration Norden, which is a collaboration with Noregio and Norden's Welfast, Nordic Welfare Center. And there's a lot more information, statistics, maps, cases, interviews, etc. you can read about uh, here. So please take a look on this website as well. So uh, let us hear if you have uh, any questions. Thank you, Lena and Sharon, for this. Uh, if someone tries to speak now, you might be uh, muted, so check that if you think that you're not getting any response. Yeah, one, one point here from Denmark. We have uh, lots of refugees, as you have in Sweden. So we have maybe um, similar problems, because a lot of people say we have too many uh, refugees and that means it's not longer a practical problem but it's also an attitude problem mm -hmm. um, but um, I don't know it, I find it very sort of difficult but that of course is up to Josephine uh, to actually find out how we combine our theme I know that's not part of your work but the ERP theme about refugees and integration because this is um, as I hear it very much uh, people who are coming there and they want to find a job and stay there whereas the integration integration of the refugees are mainly on there are some people coming here mm -hmm. and we have to look after them because their home is ruined they can't go home mm -hmm. and that's a completely different attitude uh, from the people so mm. I I think it's 
I see that it's good that if, if we could combine them and say, well, it's good. We have some people here and you are short of people. Can't we find a common solution? But mm -hmm. it's, I really find it's not that easy, even if you have positive mm -hmm. uh, attitudes from some of the mm -hmm. rural areas. Thank you. I can just say something shortly. As we mentioned in the beginning, like depending on what um, category you belong to, you also receive the different services. So I uh, know also for Sweden and for Denmark, there's this two-year program for refugees uh, receiving residence permit, where they receive a small social um, benefit and they receive like introduction program with language training, uh, even sometimes also connection to companies and so on. Um, so I agree this is a much much more uh, different situation. Many are coming from a civil war situation, many have post-traumatic stress. And Sweden also has a very, very big challenge with having received most humanitarian refugees, saying people who's at the bottom, who's had the most harsh conditions in their life so far. And this is of course uh, something where there's a need, but I still think the the ideas and the thoughts around apprenticeships and the thoughts around mentors, these things are still really important also for this group of those um, struggling the most. Yeah, and being involved in the civil society and, and that is done in Jämtland where the immigrant population uh, is mainly based on refugees on these days and that is what they are handling there and also in, in in, in the case of Finland. Yeah. Yeah, well, my. We have a comment I, from Avin have... here, I think, first. Sorry? Yeah, uh, sorry. Avin, would you like to share your comment that you wrote here in the chat? Oh, okay, Kirsten, you can say your comments again. Yeah. Okay, the <clears throat> situation here is based on uh, rural areas. Can you speak up? Okay, <clears throat> the, the problems uh, described here are uh, focused on rural areas, but I find that the same problems are found also in cities. Mm -hmm. Have you any comments mm -hmm. on that? So we had to make some kind of scope for this uh, research um, piece of research and um, and and we also because it's quite applied and solution oriented so it's also uh, some ideas around um, making more regional planners seeing the potential uh, of um, being really active in the field of attracting uh, refugees and labor migrants. So. Uh, of course, there's a lot, like I know Noreke has published several uh, reports on the theme of segregation and integration in the capital regions in the Nordic countries. So, um, so that's something we've also been looking into, but personally, Yadis and I have mostly been engaged now with the more rural context. But I agree on your point that there are many similar uh, similar cases, similar things going on. So, so in that sense, it also gives, men to, gives sense to see it a parallel. It does. Thank mm -hmm. you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a comment. Any other comments or questions? I'd like just to add the, the other one. Um, I live in a small village of only three to 400 people. And um, suddenly one day I got a uh, hundred new neighbors, which was, um, it was a hundred Syrian guys that fled the war and they were now staying in the school next to me. And I there sort of, I welcomed them and said, what can I, how can I help? So their first Danish word was mum or more because I was <laughs> their mum. Um, and, and the, the help was uh, in language and in how do we use a stove or how do we find a, a shop, mm -hmm. all sorts of things. But I think that this about mentoring or uh, apprenticeship is, is very much, if you could start that already, 
when they are SM seekers, because these guys are now my friends. Even if I don't see them, I visited some of them that stays now other parts of Denmark, but they, they felt this welcome and they, they try to make me proud of what they can do. Yeah. Uh, so if you can do that already at the SM seeker state, because some of these guys, this is three years ago, mm-hmm. some of these guys are still SM seekers. They're mm-hmm. not accepted yet. So if you wait until they are refugees, you waste a lot of time. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and, and uh, to that, it's uh, what is suggested and has been tried some uh, in, in Finland in this area is to provide uh, language learning uh, during the asylum process uh, to uh, speed up the integration if they get uh, a residence permit or refugee status. So it can, like you say, this time while waiting could be used much better. And, and I, I, I like this example that you're giving to uh, provide, uh, which you just your own uh, initiative to uh, provide them with some kind of a link to the society and connection mm-hmm. to the destination country. It was a very, yeah, lovely example. Mm-hmm. Sorry, all uh, ref- no, all SM seekers in Denmark do uh, have an option to have language uh, lessons. They don't necessarily follow them, but they have the option. And if they don't follow them, there will be a pay cut. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do we have another comment? No, I, I just want to uh, make a comment that about that we were sick doing this uh, uh, study, so it's use, uh, it can be difficult to m- remember every single detail in, in each and every country, especially when some time passes. But uh, it's, uh, yeah, we just appreciate all comments that you might have. Yes. Okay, so you will be interested in if we are sending you a mail with comments on some of what we can see here, because uh, I have, well, <laughs> lots of comments uh, so I can do that afterwards on a mail yeah yeah that would be great we, as I said there is uh, some ongoing work you is involved in uh, cooperation with the Nordic uh, welfare center um, on integration yeah for newly arrived people and um, and any comments and so on it's just of course in that way also work in progress um, covering and also the situation and the legislation even uh, change rather fast in these five Nordic countries. So thank that would be very appreciated. Yeah. And also, if I may use the chance, if some of you uh, have knowledge about research that have been done about labor market integration for uh, refugees, uh, then I would highly appreciate to, uh, to know about them. Oh, if they have some kind of a, a research done on how it has been done and, and, and if they have some kind of a results also, that would also be uh, very good. Basically, I can say like the task we received to produce this report is rather applied. So we had done a more um, uh, fast, we've done an overview for each of the countries, but since the, this field is moving so fast, it's always great to be updated on new things. So, and yes, I can see there's a question about the presentation. Yeah, we can definitely send it out as a PDF. Um, afterwards, uh, I can send it to Josephine and she can send it out on the mailing list. And also maybe the report as a whole, a link to it. So you can yes. uh, look better into it if you are interested. So we had the link to the report prior to this so that we had the chance to read it all. Yeah, thank you. Okay, okay. Which I expect everyone to have done. <laughs> Where you can. Uh, yeah, thank you. So I think we have to wrap it up now. Uh, I will send out an email afterwards uh, with a short evaluation and uh, also to the recording of this webinar and also the link in the presentation. And if you have any questions, I guess you're free to contact Anisha and Yardis and myself. And I also just want to make a, a call for like if you have other topics concerning 
uh, rural development. Uh, we are doing more webinars uh, on different themes and topics. So if you have any ideas, please contact me on that as well and we'll see what we can do. Okay. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Bye. For presentation.